I just really can't believe it. Um, it's really beautiful to be here with you all. Hmm. Um, yeah, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. It's my very first time here. So for many of you also, we are so fortunate to be inhabiting this building, which I imagine has housed many interesting things in the past. And we are here um, on the unceded territory of the coastal Miwok, Ohlone and other tribes in the area who were guardians and protected this land for many years. And I hope that some of our effort and intention to cultivate kindness and presence can really help us be better guardians to this land and to one another. So feel really fortunate we're here. It has been quite a journey to arrive here and just so much appreciation for the many people in this room who made this possible tonight. A lot of effort. I don't even want to know how many hours some of you especially have logged in to make this possible. Thank you. And the community that we've created over the course of the pandemic. It has been such a beautiful thing. Many of you will look around and recognize one another and wow, just really good fortune and really lovely to have. We never did online well prior in the Dharma Collective. It was like, oh yeah, they're in the back of the room. Did anybody turn the camera on? <laughs> it was it was underwhelming. And so it's really exciting to, you know, extend one of the greatest benefits of the COVID time, which was for a lot of us, I heard someone saying this before we started, you could attend a talk like every night of the week. You know, you could really have a lot of access to Dharma and attend talks all over the world. So really glad to have you all online with us. Thank you for being here as well. And <clears throat> yeah, this this evening, for many of you, you know, we've been making our way through this lovely book, which each chapter brings us one. Um, I don't want to think of it as linear. It's probably an ongoing process, but the chapter gives us different ways that we can make our way towards enlightenment, towards peace, towards clarity, towards kindness. And ironically or not, maybe poignantly tonight, we're going to start the chapter on coming together to be hermits. And when we say hermit, really that term, as we'll see in, in this chapter together, is, is about really having enough clarity and discipline to make space for our practice. We live in a very different time than when these teachings were first shared, in which you could really just go somewhere far away and no one could find you. That almost exists today, not really, and it certainly won't in the near future, not to get all doomsday on everyone. So how I interpret and understand this call for us to be hermits, I don't know if hermitude is a calling, but for us to find our hermitude, how do we do that? We do that by choice. And we do that by really examining like our relationship to that which pulls us into the world. And so I'm, I was really um, finding quite a lot of meaning in this chapter tonight, and we'll do a practice together. And then we will uh, look at the beautiful compiled teachings that are here and discuss them together. Um, yeah, I, I just, I think it's super meaningful to, to just reflect on the last time that many of us met together in person and what that was like. And we had no idea. I think, Mace, were, were, we, were we like, were we the last class on a Wednesday? Right before the lockdown? Lockdown was a Thursday, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think we were all here. And one of the interesting things about practice is it really invites us to be right here and to not think about the future and maybe to not think about the past. And 
it's a really important aspect also of being a hermit and giving ourselves space in the world, get out of our quite dysfunctional relationship to time. Uh, if you're anything like myself and many of us, we have, as John O'Donohue puts it, a very perverse relationship to time, a very extractive relationship with time. And time is a construct. Time is not our unconditioned nature of mind. So we're such a, so lucky every time we come together to practice, we can kind of poke at that construct of time. We can give ourselves a taste of timelessness, of boundlessness. So there's a beautiful relationship here in this idea of how do we become or move towards this space we need for our practice by withdrawing from the world and how we start to understand our relationship to time. So with that, I'm gonna invite us to Take a moment and find a posture. We're actually in seats here, most of us, most on the ground. Do you want a cushion there? You're sure, are you sure? There's some here. I welcome anyone who wants to sit on the ground to do so. You are also, there's not a lot of space here, so you could lie down, but I'm not sure that's possible right at this moment. There are some blankets there if folks are feeling cold. And for sitting in a chair, you know, it's, it's, I'm obviously cross-legged, but it is nice to sit back. You can also bring yourself a little forward and have that uprightness of a spine. For most folks to have that sense of groundedness in their chair, having feet on the ground and feel that connection. If your feet don't quite hit the ground, you could put a blanket underneath or a backpack, whatever you have with you. And then as we kind of attend to the composition of our posture, we really want to attend to feeling as though there's spaciousness around the belly so that we can have our breath really come and go freely. We invite this attitude and posture of dignity, of uprightness, of vividness. and finding a place for the hands to be where the neck doesn't feel strained. So you could even notice if you put your hands a little farther forward, how it feels or farther back, just as though we could take this posture on and be perfectly still. It's okay to move. No one will come around with a bamboo rod and discipline you, um, but it is really nice to have a posture where we can feel our stillness. And gently allowing the eyes to close if that's comfortable and feel safe. Otherwise, having the eyes just slightly open, maybe a gaze in front of you. Begin by really collecting our attention and gathering it into the space of the body. Giving ourselves a moment here to relax and to release tension, beginning by noticing areas in the face that commonly hold tension. 
any tension we may be feeling between the eyebrows and around the eyes. And releasing tension through the cheekbones and the jaw. And inviting that experience of releasing tension throughout the body. For those of us in person, in the space, we may notice the sounds around us. We can experience and notice those through the body as well. Certain sounds may be comforting, other sounds annoying or judged in some other negative way. As much as possible, just make it not a problem. Keep noticing whatever is noticeable through the body. In addition to the level of sensation in the body of aches or tensions, we may notice the emotional residue from our day. Maybe stress we've been holding or excitement. Just giving our kind attention again without making it a problem, without having an agenda to just be with the sensations of emotion in the body. And if you get caught up in distraction, no problem. Just relax, release whatever has captured your attention and gently return for a couple more moments here of being with the body, welcoming whatever is here in the body. And take a moment now and shift our attention to our intention. What has brought us here together tonight? An intention can be specific, it can be quite broad.
and invite an intention that allows the heart to open beyond just ourselves. What is it we seek to cultivate or strengthen in service, in community? On our choice to practice together this evening is a choice to investigate and forge the inner pathways. And to do so, it asks of us our full presence. One way to invite or motivate that full presence is to go through our preliminary practices, our remembrances of why we are here instead of out in the world with the world. But taking this small moment of withdrawing and renouncing through practice, all the external aspects of our life, relationships, We do so because we know that these practices support us at a deeper level. So I will share the four remembrances, speaking the phrase and allowing us to sit with it, holding the words in mind, noticing how it stirs the body and heart. The first remembrance is to keep in mind the preciousness and fragility of human life. Eve, if you can hear me, we lost your sound.
true. It's true. It's true. Just we just heard. I just heard an echo for a second there. Yes. Oh, no. it came in. Do you want to turn off the vote? No, it's trying to do It's your echoey. I still can't. Whoops. That sounds good. I don't hear an echo. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, hear can, you. can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Cool. Sorry, you all missed the meditation. It sounds like you had a more open, spacious meditation. Is the okay, problem we, we just lost the the video so yeah any yeah. question on the practice whether it is your first time practicing this practice in which we went through some of these preliminaries so this is somewhat of a, a common practice we did the lojong slogans <clears throat> for about eight months last year and um yeah, as a result, we kind of go through these preliminary practices. Often people will spend an entire month on just one of those. So it is a lot to have all four. But the idea is that it can, um, it can remind us um, Okay, how about now? Okay, good. Wow, exciting. <laughs> so yeah, questions on practice, reflections on practice. What's it like to practice with all these other people? Sounds, bloopers, otherwise? Yes? Yeah, you know, like by the time that I finally settled in, <laughs> like, all right, this is what meditating is like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I even, obviously we had some disruptions, but I, I felt a vulnerability in like practicing in person again. You know, there's like a, oh, wow, there's other people and they breathe and they move and stuff. And it's 24th Street, always given us some, we have some neighbors. Um, I, I turned off your sound, but I can see the, uh, the chat um, just because it was a little distracting to hear it here, but one moment. I can hear your sound, I can hear you now. Claudia, are there any questions online? I don't see. Just as please repeat the questions from Gina and Sylvia, but I don't know. Okay. I don't see anything else. Okay, cool. Stay tuned on that. I I have a question, Gina. Uh, Eve. Just Go one ahead. sec. There's one in the Go one ahead. in the room, and we'll do that. Okay. Yes, I was, please. I just um, was aware for the first time since the shutdown of of my of 
getting used to, like sh needing to shed my fear of being in close proximity to a group of other humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I didn't really know I had because I've been in, you know, check your backs card where mm -hmm. mm -hmm. situations. Yeah. And this is the first one where it hasn't been that. Yep. And I realize I'm anxious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, the woman is sharing here um, that being with other people for the first time. And did you feel that as like um, in the body anxiety, in the mind, both? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't overwhelming, but I didn't even realize I was feeling it. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I, I think I felt it in, in a bit of tension in my, in my shoulders and chest. Yeah. Kind of, hold, kind of holding myself mm -hmm. hard. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And as all of us who practice meditation know, often the practice is realizing a lot of stuff that can be um, somewhat difficult or even unpleasant, um, whether or not that has to do with this specific moment or otherwise. And it's the, it's the, it's the difficult challenge with especially meditation, but even more so mindfulness kind of being sold as this, you know, it'll make you feel better. It'll do your taxes, your laundry, <laughs> younger, more vital. Um, and actually, it also shows you like a lot of these difficulties. And, and sometimes, hopefully, we can use them as insights. But sometimes it's also like, oh, wow, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, thank you. Claudia, did you have a question? Just, just if you could remind us of the four I don't know what you call them, but you were beginning to say them about the when we lost the sound and you were talking about the preciousness of life. And then the other one, I think it is karma and then joyful enthusiasm, but I can't remember. Is yeah. That... Preciousness of human life. And then, you know, essentially the reality of impermanence and then karma, everything we do has an action. And then samsara, like seeking pleasure and trying to avoid pain will just always lead us to more pain. Um, and again, it's, it's not, it's not a, a per se joyful message, but I do think, especially in considering, for me, uh, reading this chapter, as I mentioned, was a lot about my relationship to time. And a lot, I don't know if anyone else feels this, but I would say 85% of what distracts me in my meditation is the future. Like this thing I need to do, this thing I want to do, where am I going to eat? Where am I going to buy groceries? What are, like a lot of future. And if anyone, I mean, everyone here has, I'm sure, when we have experienced heartbreak and loss, all of us have, you ever notice how time is just cut? There, like the future, it's like there's no future, right? The present has just completely captivated us. And so not saying we um, want to live in a state of heartbreak and loss, but these remembrances in a way, they give us a dose of that, like a homeopathic dose, right? A little bit of the poison so that we remember, like, stop it with all that. Stop it. You need it, but not right when you're practicing, right? Later. So that's kind of the inspiration for those remembrances. Yeah. Mace, yeah, and then Jason, yeah. I mean, I just want to say I'm so fucking psyched to be practicing in presence again with people. And I actually practice more deeply when I'm with others. Like, you know, when I'm on retreat, you know, in a room full of people for some reason. I mean, I think I'm kind of like hijacking, like I'm backpacking on other people's um, concentration. Um, so... But, and tonight was like almost too, ex I mean, I've been in body, physical presence and work for a long, long time. So it's not being around people, although it's interesting to be around people without masks on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I'm just sort of like, and then when you did the space, I love that practice imagining the space above and around you and then it was like kind of the room had felt like a little it's dense in here like it's different from i'm like oh it's different from the other space it's tight but then when you did that it felt like a lot more spacious and i personally love all the sounds like i think it's like i don't know there's something about it that's yeah very enlivening and, yeah um, 
So I just wanted to yeah. say that, yeah. But, Thank and you. it's a trip. Mace, Mace is sharing that, um, you know, she's feeling a lot of the power and the um, practice field together and that it actually really supports her in practice. And I do think, right, we can feel unsafe around others, which this pandemic has created, but we can also, part of the reason there is Sangha and that the whole goal of practice um, needs to be realized with other people, except when we do our little hermit moments um, is that we do we carry a lot of momentum with each other it really can help so it is nice to feel that yeah Jason then Walt yeah yeah I just wanted to um, sort of draft on what they said too and that it was really great to be in the meditation and I just felt this immediate sense of space and dropping in like ah we're all together here mm -hmm. and it was like and then I was really writing everything the sounds I loved it you know um, and then when you started going into the remembrances, it was like, I, I started feeling like, okay, now I'm going with this. And then, you know, you said you were about to say impermanence and then boom, you know, <laughs> got left out of it. And I just started laughing and turned, I was just like, I wanted to just crack up. Mm -hmm. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, what a perfect <laughs> moment to have that happen. And then you went on to talk about impermanence. And I was like, uh, reminded just how, how kind of like, I have to make sure I don't start enjoying something too much because mm. you know, it's kind of like really i don't know it's really interesting I, I i enjoyed what i was feeling and then it got distracted and then i enjoyed the distraction mm -hmm. and then i sort of came back into it i never really locked back into where i was feeling but i was like that's okay so i just there was something else that happened when um when we said space i actually felt disoriented like i got this like good like i don't know something clicked and I almost felt like, wow. So I don't know. I just wanted to share that, yeah. that, that, that something about the space, I think, has done nice. all of that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful. So Jason's describing the experience of dropping in deeply and then also being brought out of it uh, when we realized we had lost you all and coming back and being able to appreciate what he experienced, um, even as that changed. And a real sensation, like a... The disorientation, sometimes I can feel like dizziness. Yeah. So what's going, what possibly is going on when that happens is we so much shift out of our conventional everyday reality, which is very um, grounding in a way, but also kind of like holds us down. And there's, it could possibly be just a true release of energy, like through the channels, so that there's all that rushing of energy and almost a dizziness. Um, and, and also just when we experience experience free from all of our projections and agenda, it is like quite spacious. So this is called an altered state, right? And you can get there in a lot of different ways. But the subtlety of getting there in meditation is pretty wild, right? Because you're like, wow, like, you know, you could have five or six beers, uh, or maybe just two, and have an altered state, right, of like disorientation. But to get there through the subtleness of mind and breath, you actually, it's, it's, it takes a while, but you can start to sustain it. And there's something about it that's deeply refreshing. It's like, all of a sudden, we stop that ongoing loop of what am I doing next? And what's happening? What just happened? It's just I think, it, I think it was about the, the space made it feel like I went into hyperdrive. Mm. I hit the, uh, what do they call it in Star Trek? <laughs> yeah. I need to start watching Star Trek. What's the name? Warp speed. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Oh, uh, harkening back to. Uh, I don't know, uh, pandemic and masks and such. Um, when I, you know, when I first arrived here, oh man, I was, I was like really hyped and psyched and still am actually, but you know, I wasn't thinking about masking at all. And then, you know, we got, we all gathered around and I said, whoa, this is like a muni bus, you know? <laughs> And what's the circulation? And, yeah. and, you know, it got to me for a bit, but it's like, no, this is, 
It's a choice. Mm -hmm. I made a choice to come here. I made a choice to be here with fellow mm -hmm. meditators. And it's like, okay, I also made a choice that because I'm 73 years old and I have two or three, you know, uh, conditions that might be debilitating mm -hmm. if I, you know. So I said, okay, I guess I have to put on the mask, but yeah, mm -hmm. I can deal with it, and it's still good to be here. So, yeah. You know, but it there was a shift there mm -hmm. that brought me down. Yep. And then it's like, well, it is what it is, you yeah. know, and it is my choice. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing your process with us, and I think it is. Um, <laughs> It's so, especially to be moving from the excitement and enthusiasm of being together and then also the reality of, of risk and challenge and yeah, this time. Yeah. Um, so Walt was sharing with us his concern of being here, his excitement of being here and then his concern of being here and how to be together with the mask and how to take those choices, um, make those choices. Um, yeah, I'd love to, to read us a little bit here on the Hermit um, and discuss some of this work. If there Are there other practice questions, though? I really like the richness of hearing people's practice. Yes. What's the book? Oh, the book is called On the Path to Enlightenment. You know, go big. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, um, so Matthew Ricard, some of you know, is a, a Buddhist monk, a scholar, a humanitarian, really just super lovely human. He had the unfortunate title of the happiest man in the world as according to his fMRI scans because he has just these hugely enlarged neural pathways of happiness. Um, and he, you know he's the last person in the world who wants a title. And he was just like, no, thank you. Um, and what he did is every year, it's, it's so fitting, every year he goes to his Hermitage, which is, which is pictured here, it's a, it's a meditation center that he supports in the Himalayas. And he goes for about six months and brings his favorite texts and dedicates himself to practice. Mm -hmm. So he really, um, and then he put this book together of the favorite snippets mm -hmm. of all of his texts that he loves. Cheating. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, though, as Chandra, my uh, wonderful, um, co-teacher um, mentioned last week there there's only like one mention of a woman teacher once in here so so happy last week that she brought Machik Labran's teachings for us and I felt it was such a beautiful way to finish out our last chapter we spent the most time on this last chapter which was on the nature of mind really beautiful um, we're actually already on chapter 12 I highly recommend this book it's not one you have to read in any sort of linear fashion because it's all these excerpts. Uh, it's really nice for practice. Yeah, last time I sat with you, you were still on the. Uh, oh Some yeah, the that was a good. That was a good. I want to go back. Yeah, yeah. No time to lose. Um, so I'll read a. I'll read a little bit. Matthew starts off in the chapter, um, and I I love his call for us. <clears throat> He said, um, the vocation of the hermit is misunderstood. Hermits do not withdraw from the world because they feel rejected or because they can find nothing better to do than wander in the mountains or because they're unable to assume their responsibilities. They make their decision, which may seem extreme because they've realized they cannot control their mind and solve the problem of happiness and suffering amidst the endless, futile, and distracting activities of ordinary life. Right? Doesn't that feel familiar? They are not running away from the world. They distance themselves to put in perspective and better understand how it functions. They do not flee their fellow men and women, but need time to cultivate authentic love and compassion that will not be affected by ordinary concerns, such as pleasure or displeasure, gain and loss, praise and blame. And I really, you know, I think this is, you know, often, especially when you first hear about Buddhism or Buddhist practice, people assume like, why are you going to go away from the world? Why are you going to escape from the world when the world needs you? And I love this description because he highlights this isn't fleeing. This isn't running away. 
This is almost as though you are going to your Olympic level facility <laughs> to do the training needed to love all beings. It's really hard to find the time and space to do so amidst our everyday life. Though, uh, I know we can. I know we can. And I, again, I, I really interpret this call for being a hermit as something we can do every single practice and something we can do on a half day on a weekend. We don't, you know, of course it's wonderful if we have, I think Noam got some hermitude recently. Uh, how many weeks of retreat did you get in a row? Was it like three? I did two weeks and then a week, um, and then another week. Yeah, yeah. Three, three weeks. weeks. Yeah. yeah, and like he's levitating. Yeah. <laughs> At least I love everyone. Yes, so <laughs> Noam loves everyone as a result, which I am, I'm, you know, I hate to say that you did before, um, but <laughs> maybe it's stronger. Um, so, yeah, so I just, I really like thinking about this. Um, and I love, I love this other analogy he gives. He says, the wounded animal hides in the forest to heal its wounds until it is fit to roam as it pleases. And though I don't, I actually, I, I can kind of relate to that de idea sometimes, especially emotionally of feeling like a wounded animal in this world. You know, just like how much of our personal and collective suffering is impacting the body, heart, and mind. And sometimes we need that space to, to hold ourselves. Um, and he says, for someone who remains in the freshness of mindfulness of the present moment, time does not have the heaviness, heaviness of days spent in distraction, but the lightness of a life fully savored. Mm -hmm. And it was that line that really got me thinking about time. Um, and it's interesting, get some notes on time. <clears throat> yeah, as I, as I shared, some of you know that this, the late, great John O'Donohue, who was a poet and a, um, he was a, a Catholic priest for quite a while and then kind of became more of a, a philosopher and writer. And in his short but incredible life, he wrote beautifully on our relationship to the natural world, our relationship to our inner world, and our relationship to kind of space and time. And he had this interview with Krista Tippett, who I know many of you know as a podcaster, and she puts it to the top. She did it in 2005, and she puts it to the top of her queue like every couple months. And every time I listen to it, I hear something new. And I hadn't heard him in his plea for us to heal our relationship to time. Really think about our relationship to time. And um, it's very interesting because I've been also reading the work of David Abrams, who's an ecologist and philosopher, someone who wrote a, a quite a well-known book called The Spell of the Sensuous. And he looks back a lot at the historical and um, indigenous practices of language, of community, amazing we're really in the world here um, of language and community and one of the things he talks about is you know the different constructs and different perceptions of time and of space and it really has me thinking this is so obvious but that like um, time is a construct we have created it and it feels like it's it's the only thing that's real and true and yet we adhere to it in a way that we learned when we were young and that when we have these moments like Jason described of kind of dizziness or kind of falling out of what sometimes is called the trance of our conventional reality, we can have a different relationship to time. It's not as though seasons don't happen, we still age, we die, but the way that most of us relate to time is so messed up. It is just so heavy and um, it's really nice to try to kind of deconstruct specifically time. Um, yeah, especially when we think about, you know, the relationship of time and space together. So I think our contemporary relationship to time is absent of space, like completely. We don't put any spaciousness into that time. It's you know, the next hour, the next hour, the next hour. 
So I imagine if we if we try to take on this relationship of being a hermit, what would it look like to even have to decide from 7 a.m. until 2 p.m.? <laughs> There's like three car alarms. I don't know if you guys can hear this. It's like amazing. <laughs> we're, yeah. We're we can hear, I, I feel for the recording and the people who will be listening to this recording. Wow. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen um, when the Dalai Lama comes like into a new celebration and they have all these like horns and like <laughs> on the drums and it's kind of just like dispelling of the, the um, malevolent entities. Okay. Um, Talk about distractions in our present time. <laughs> we need refuge. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I and I do think this, you know, this taking the refuge, right, of of taking that space away, um, even if it's four or five hours, it can be a really interesting practice. I know some of you take longer retreats, but this idea of doing even part of a weekend or part of a day off as retreat and letting it just flow, like setting a timer, it can help us really see our relationship to time and maybe see some of the dysfunction that we have around time. So before I move to other parts of it, thoughts or questions, reflections on this relationship to time that we have here. I just love the whole concept of the hermit idea because I was laughing because I'm like, I feel so validated because that's how my life feels like almost every day now. And I really actually love it. Mm. <laughs> I'm kind of guilty about it, but I just, spend a lot of time in the house isolated and I actually love it and it does feel like time has slowed down mm. and I feel like more just creative and in my own world mm. and yeah it's been good in that sense mm. but yeah I feel like being a hermit um you have to be able to carve out your own space and separate yourself from the world a bit so I guess you mean mentally and physically I yeah guess. yeah exactly so uh Anna's saying here that she's been spending more time on her own and kind of enjoying that creativity. Okay. Sylvia wants to say something. Sylvia, please. Okay. Hello. Hello. Let me tell you, um, I had a dream, which I, I don't think that it has repeated, but in my mind, I have worked on it because it was amazing. Um, I saw myself going to the woods, like the Buddha. And I was going to stay there. It was in my mind that I had to do it. And I wanted to do it. And I said goodbye to my family and bye, bye, bye to everybody. And I came to a place where I didn't know how to enter. I didn't know what was inside, but I knew that was, there was something because it was kind of a stones and prepared to be something. And I push the door and it opens up. I go in, there's nobody, but there is a lot of water, like going down from, from the top, going down the stones and going down. And then I see that the door closes and I'm there forever. <laughs> so I say, oh my God. That's, I was so scared, but then I started looking at everything and everything was like special, uh, something that I didn't expect to see in my whole life. And the one thing that there was inside, it was water. Mm. So I was drinking water and drinking water and drinking water. And like, I don't know how many months I stayed there, mm. but suddenly I'm standing close to a wall or I, like I was able to go up and, and I recline myself and the, the door opens and I'm outside naked because I don't have anything to wear anymore. And I go, I walk and suddenly some people come to me. That's it. Wow. So you got to be a hermit in your dream. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. 
That's really amazing. Yeah. It's interesting too, because in the dream space, time is so different. It's, it is, right? So we think of sleeping, dreaming, and dying as these states of consciousness that are not separate, but that we think of them as so different. And if we can come into consciousness in our dream state, the hope is that we can come to consciousness as we're dying as well. Well, that's a beautiful practice dream. Yeah. Yeah, and it reminds me uh, when I've been practicing with this idea, I've been for the last couple of days trying to find ways to stop time before I practice. In one case, I imagined getting on a train. Because when you get on a train, all of a sudden there's nothing else to do. You can't go anywhere. Okay, I'm on the train. It's a meditation train. It's going. And then also I realized that in meditation, for many of us, we go into some kind of fantasy. We have a, you know, image or vision of being somewhere else. And I usually try to, I'm like, oh, no, that's bad. But I actually invited that kind of more liminal, hypnagogic space of imagery. Because that isn't a place that I'm going or a thing I need to do. That's actually in the realm more of the timeless. So there's some really wonderful research around mind wandering. And mind wandering got a really bad rap a couple, maybe about a decade ago, that whenever we mind wander, it's negative and we're just unhappy. And that's inaccurate. A lot of our mind wandering is this beautiful, imaginative, imaginal space, like the space we do in feeding your demons or bringing forth compassion and cultivating that, that muscle is a way of actually I don't want to overspeak, but I will anyway. It's transcending space and time. We're creating a different dimension and a different universe. So it's really interesting the ways we can start to kind of play with our fixed notions of time. So even on my way here tonight, as you notice, I was so emotional getting here. And part of it was really taking in the multiplicity of time. So biking here from my house, you know, I grew up in the neighborhood where I live. So I just was thinking of how many memories, how much time has passed, how much time in the future I just can't imagine. I don't remember the last time I biked to the Dharma Collective, but I certainly didn't know I would be here now. And just this almost, you know, almost unfathomable in a good way, ineffable understanding of our relationship to time. That kind, that's the mystery, right? That's not breathe in, breathe out, follow your breath, attention. Like there's a mystery part for us in practice that we cultivate. Um, that sense of timelessness, boundlessness. Thank you for sharing the dream. The dream is a beautiful space of timelessness. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go to... A couple other inspiring passages here. This one here is on page 180, for those who have the book. So there's a lot of, I'll, I'll take a moment, there's a lot of talk here of the eight worldly concerns. And I won't do a pop quiz for you all because uh, they are, there. if you could make a list of all the lists in Buddhism, it would be overwhelming. Um, so the eight worldly you know, preoccupations or kind of concerns are happiness and suffering, right? that we are always thinking about our own happiness, or our own suffering, but it's real. Like even if you just have indigestion, that's, it's hard to not think about that, right? So mm -hmm. it's not that it's wrong or bad, but that so much of our attention is in that fame and insignificance, we want to be important, we want to be influential, we really don't want to be um, unimportant and feel like what we do doesn't matter. Which is so interesting again because all, all of that is an outward looking as opposed to that internal meaning making we can create. Praise and blame, it's my favorite one. Just, you know, it's so nice, people are like, you're so great, and then they say like, ugh, what's wrong with you? I actually think praise and shame might be more appropriate for our contemporary culture. And then um, gain and loss. So these are the eight worldly concerns. They are taking up a lot of our um, daily bandwidth of attention and energy, understandably, and yet 
they don't relate necessarily to our deeper level of being, to the consciousness that allows us to really be in something more spacious. Yes? I'm going to ask you there, was it happiness and sadness or happiness and suffering? Suffering, suffering. yeah. Suffering. And, you know, suffering has a lot of different um, definitions. So the one I really like uh, is just there's actually levels of suffering, but the one I think is very appropriate for most kind of contemporary folks who have their basic needs met is unsatisfactoriness. Right? There's a lot. Like, there's a lot of things. Like, oh, there's like two car alarms, right? <laughs> it's like our Night of the Dharma Collective, and everything's, you know, this kind of, it's not like, you're not like, oh, I'm suffering, but it's things are so unsatisfying. And I think especially as we live in a more and more digital world in which we can like mute and not have to deal, that actually our capacity to be with the unsatisfactoriness is getting worse. It's really getting worse. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Jacob. Jacob, thanks, nice to meet you. Um, so I, I do think it's, you know, and then how preoccupied we get with suffering or unsatisfactoriness and then it changes, like that car alarm's gone, right? But often we like prolong our suffering. We keep thinking about it. Uh, and I think when we're talking about the eight worldly concerns or preoccupations, it's not that they don't matter. It's that it takes up every ounce of our attention so that we don't have any space left uh, for creativity and for presence. Thank you. Yeah. So this first passage is, being contaminated by the eight worldly concerns, they have made the duration of their practice, the duration of their lives, and accepted all the difficulties. Without a care for their body and their life, they did nothing but practice the Dharma in a wild, lonely place, or hermitage. He's talking about um, the hermits here. They were not fools or people who did not know what to do with their lives, nor yet sons who did not want to manage the affairs of their families. But if we look at the practitioners of today, like us, those who live like these sages are as rare as stars in the daytime. And even if there are a handful of them, they fall under the influence of circumstances of life, and very few reach the end of the path. If we really want to attain the ultimate goal of the Dharma, we must fulfill the six conditions that will lead us to appreciate solitude. Being able to rely on one's own strength when the spiritual master is not there having no doubts to clear up or obstacles to remove, being free from the problems of disease and harmful influences, withdrawing from the company of worldly beings, having received all the instructions to achieve one's own good and that of others, and having a clear understanding of the final and ultimate view. So these are really um, quite high levels to have. Right, for us to be able to live as hermits. And some of you may know, but in especially in Tibet, where this most of these teachings are pulled from, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of hermits living in caves over thousands of years. And they would sometimes come down and teach. But it was not unusual to spend twelve or twenty years as a hermit, really perfecting one's Dharma, and then come and teach or practice that just for the sake of all beings. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare, right? He says as rare as stars in the daytime, I'd say even more rare for that to happen these days. Though some of you may be familiar with Minger Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. Probably he's like, you know, he is um, one of the most like accomplished and beloved teachers in contemporary Tibetan Buddhism. And he literally just disappeared for three years. He took on a wandering hermit as his role. So he did this from 2015 to 2019 or 18, I, I believe. And he lived in this you know, wonderful palace in Kathmandu. And everyone knew he was going on a three-year retreat. But they assumed he'd do so you know, in a little cottage where they bring him food every day. But instead, he left all his worldly goods, got on a train, and disappeared. He wrote a beautiful book. Uh, the joy of being alive. Is the joy of living? Isn't that a Julia Child? That's a joy of cooking. Like open to the heart of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, love with the world. Yeah, in love with the world. In love with the world. <laughs> in love with the world. And and it's really beautiful how he confronts 
how painful it is to let go of everything he loves, everything he knows, all his comforts, how terrified he is. It does, he doesn't make it sound easy. Um, and I'm not encouraging all of us to do so, but I, I think it is interesting just as like when we are doing our daily runs to imagine the athletic capacity of Olympiads, like to know the few full like human potential. Um, these three stanzas I love. Um, so we have Gualia Yankopa first on 182. In the lonely place, the thought of death fixed in the heart, the hermit deeply disgusted with attachments draws the boundary of his retreat by renouncing the thoughts of this life and does not meet those who know, does not meet those known as the eight worldly preoccupations. So very pithy. It's kind of what we are talking about tonight. So the only way to enter this retreat is with that knowing of death. Because otherwise, why would we do it? I mean, you know, there's like nice food and people and things to do in the world. Why would we retreat? knowing that we will one day die and that in order for us to prepare for death we have to prepare by training the heart and mind of course you can die without training your heart and mind though we may not be able to actually um, feel a sense of freedom and calmness and ease and i think you know for myself i uh, both lost a parent a couple years ago and, and have a very elderly parent I think of it not only as preparation for death, but of for these last stages and phases of life, where we may not have as much access and flexibility to do what we want in the world. When we train in the Dharma, it's like we're training in the one thing you can't lose. Uh, so that is very encouraging. <clears throat> and another stanza here, among the crowds, the hatred and attachment grow. While in the wilderness, good qualities flourish. So live in the lonely mountains and watch the spectacle of your mind. From now on, blown by the wind of renunciation, light the fire of emptiness and compassion. Fan the flames with the fan of attention and burn the brushwood of ordinary mind and its thoughts. So sweet, and, and especially this one, um, this stanza, you could just think of an inspiration for a weekend retreat or weekend long. So among the crowds, hatred and attachment grow. It, there is a benefit to not being around other people. I just mentioned how wonderful the Sangha is, and we are. <laughs> and yet, um, one thing that can happen is our constant kind of social comparison. Right? So we're in a group with other people, and we're like, am I above them? Am I, am I below them? Am I just like them? And that happens when we are in the world, just a natural part of our human mind. So to just give ourselves a break from that kind of level of what can be a subtle aggression, right? Am I better? Am I worse? Um, and then the second part here, but while in the wilderness, our good qualities flourish. And, you know, we have Golden Gate Park, Land's End, Heron's Head, you know, beautiful places where I do think partially, of course, the natural world can give us the calm. But it also gives us that respite. We aren't always comparing, right? When we look to nature, we don't see a reflection of ourselves. We see a reflection of the infinite. And so live in the lonely mountains, AKA go to Corona Heights or Twin Peaks, uh, and watch the spectacle of your mind. And I love this idea of it as a spectacle because a spectacle is something that's exciting. It's inspiring. You can laugh at it. But you're not trying to pretend that it's running the show, like really putting your mind in its place as a spectacle. And then from now on, blown by the wind of renunciation. And renunciation, I've mentioned this before, it's, it's such an unappealing word. If you ever wanted people to get into something like Buddhism, you would not tell them about renunciation first. But renunciation is really, it's like our natural movement towards what's wholesome for us natural movement towards what's wholesome to us. So, you know, I recognize sitting for more than an hour and a half is really bad for my back. I renounce sitting for more than an hour and a half. It's silly, but it's true. Our, our renunciation comes from what's wholesome, what's truly good for us. And there's such a, such a dignity in that. 
you know, really seeing clearly and being able to choose wisely. So light the fire of emptiness and compassion. So being able to see that all things are always changing, always changing and shifting, and feeling that deep kindness. And fan the flames. So don't forget about impermanence and compassion. Keep it in mind, keep it in mind, keep it in mind. And burn the brushwood of ordinary mind. So you keep this fire of compassion alive by burning your thoughts. <laughs> but I actually like it because a lot of our mental energy, especially as practitioners, we're trying to get rid of it. We're like, I just, you know, I, I wish there weren't these thoughts. Like, ah, oh, stop with these thoughts. But what if instead you use them as fuel for the fire? Right? It's like that kind of transferring the energy. And you just notice, here are thoughts. Here they're coming. Wow, another reminder that I need to embrace even closer compassion. So that, I think, is, we only got to page one on the hermit, so <laughs> there will certainly be more hermiting. And I, yeah, I encourage you all to think about taking that mini respite, whether it's 45 minutes or two hours, to dedicate yourself to practice, to the spectacle of the mind and to compassion. Um, so we will take a couple moments and drop in here to help give ourselves one last wonderful taste of being together and practicing here on this first night of return. So taking a moment and turning towards first our own inner call from compassion. Recognizing the unsatisfactoriness, the pain and the difficulty that is a necessary and inevitable part of life, and yet which we still want to be held in. So allowing our heart to connect to this aspiration to be free from our losses, our pains, our senses of insufficiency, isolation, our worry and our dread for ourselves and the world. Let the heart feel tender and caring towards our own pain. As we inhale, we inhale with an awareness of the struggles and difficulties. And as we exhale, we extend this wish. May I be free from suffering. May I know peace and ease. May I feel belonging and love. Inhale with this aspiration to care for our own well-being. Exhale. May I be free. May I be held. <clears throat> May I know belonging and love. Taking a moment to recognize that this desire to be free is shared by every being in this room and by our friends connected virtually. That in this moment, each of us feels that heartfelt desire to be free. Each of us has a unique and yet shared sense of suffering and pain. And again, using our breath with the inhale, taking in that recognition of shared suffering, challenge. Exhale. May we all be free. May we know peace and ease. May we feel love and belonging.
A couple more breaths, drawing in for one another, extending out a wish of compassion. And then letting our care and concern just completely blow open the doors of our heart. Opening to not only this block and this city, this state, this country, all beings on this planet. Being seen and unseen, all of whom have some form of struggle and difficulty and suffering. We don't need to bear it for them. We can dedicate our heart to care for them. As we inhale, drawing in with this recognition of global challenge, of difficulty. Exhale, may we all be free. May we all know peace and ease. May we all feel love and belonging. <laughs> mm. oh, wonderful to be with you all wow in person so wonderful so if it's your first time the dharma collective welcome join the family as me said it's a volunteer run organization so we could always interested in hearing about folks and their interest to come host tonight or hang out with us and otherwise are there's in-person sits other other days right now or is wednesday the main yeah we <clears throat> have um monday evenings uh with tucker okay and, and crew nice crew. nice and um uh sundays Sorry. sundays with michael owens some days, uh, Michael Owens, who lives in San Luis Obispo, appears on that big screen, and we oh, gather so, cool. here. And also, every morning from 7.30 to 8.15, right, right here, no teacher, just sit, and it's very sweet with mm. all the noises. Mm. <laughs> and um, I just want to say on behalf of the board and all the uh, many people who have mm. made this possible that I'm just so moved and grateful mm. to see it's cool to sit out here and see <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't know if the people online know that we can see you on a big TV oh. so just so you know I mean like, yeah. oh <laughs> didn't know that so yeah <laughs> gratitude to all of you and it, as as people said at the beginning it was really important to us to make it, uh, to make this happen in a way that everyone could come or not come at their comfort level and continue to zoom in. So, mostly thank you, Eve. Hmm. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. Yay. So, I heard there's cookies in the back. So, Please save me one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try them.